Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on automated filter rule generation for ad blocking, or auto FR for short. Uh, this is joint work with my advisor, Athena Markopoulou, and our collaborators, Sam Amalaki and Zubair Shafiq. So what makes filter rule generation challenging? Well, the first challenge is really learning the correct rule granularity, because this can affect, obviously, the potential breakage that the rule can cause, and the lifetime of filter rule as well, whether it's easily evaded or not. And it can also you know, affect the number of rules in a filter list. So I'll, I'll illustrate this challenge uh, by focusing on URL-based rules. For example, we can, take, uh, we can have ESLD rules here, or we can have more specific rules uh, like FQDNs or ones with paths that can target particular JavaScript resources. Um, now, of course, each one of these rules have their pros and cons. Uh, for example, um, for ESLD rules, they can be hard to evade, of course, and of course, that also means uh, fewer rules to maintain because of their granularity. But for the cons, they have a much higher potential for breakage because they can overblock. Now, on the other extreme for rules with paths, they have a less potential for breakage, right? Because they're targeting a very specific resource to block. Uh, but in terms of cons, they're very easily evaded. So an adversary can just uh, change the path and then to f evade that rule. And it can also cause more rules to maintain for filter list authors if, they, if we only rely on these type of rules. Now, of course, um, oh, for FQDN rules, we can just you know, consider them the middle ground that inherits the pros and cons of their neighbors. Now, of course, ESOD rules are preferred uh, because of their pros, especially if they do not cause breakage. And, but if they do, then you know, we can go more fine and grain to F to FQDNs and with paths. So of course, we can see that rule granularity matters because of the trade-off between uh, the effectiveness of the rule and um, breakage. So for the second challenge, we find that creating rules have high human effort, right? Because it has to scale to perhaps thousands or even millions of sites uh, for filter list authors um, across the web and over time. And I'll illustrate this challenge by looking at the filter list uh, author workflow. For example, given a filter list author and a site uh, that she needs to create rules for to block ads, in this particular setting, uh, we're going to consider that the filter list author has no uh, prior knowledge or no existing rules um, that is effective for this particular site. So she has to do it from scratch. So in order to do so, what she's going to do is look at the list of possible outgoing network requests, and then uh, choose one to block based on perhaps her domain knowledge as a filter list author or keywords like ads or bidding. Um, and then once she blocks it, she's going to have to test the effectiveness through visual inspection. So what does this mean? Uh, first, she can look at how the uh, site behaves uh, naturally. You know, uh, where are the ads being um, loaded? Where are the legitimate content for the page, like uh, images and text? So we call this the base representation of the site. Once a request is blocked, she can look at, you know, are the ads being blocked? Are any missing content uh, uh, being blocked as well? And of course, the goal of blocking the request is to see if it can block all ads with minimal or no breakage at all. We call this the operating point. Now, once she finds that a particular request um, is effective, she's going to have to figure out, OK, well, wh at what granularity level am I going to create uh, the rules for? And so, like I said, there's different granularities, like ESLDs, FQDNs. And she's going to have uh, to test one again, probably the ESLD one, like it's preferred. And she'll uh, use that filter rule to test. And then, of course, uh, do the visual inspection again. So this iterative approach, uh, she's going to have to do it over and over until it converges to a set of rules that are effective at blocking all ads for this particular site, then output them uh, and deploy them to end users. And the third challenge, and it's implicitly implied, that of course these rules have to be effective. And here we just focus on rules that block ads. And these two challenges are exactly what AutoFR tries to um, address in our work. And next, I'm going to explain how we formulate this problem of filter rule generation 
as a reinforcement learning problem. And this basically allows us to convert this human process of creating rules to an automated process. So first, what we found is that uh, we're going to formulate the problem as a multi-armed bandit problem for two reasons. Uh, first, we consider filter rules as um, the effect on the site as independent. So if, for example, rule A will block one ad, and rule B can block two other ads. And if you use them together, they'll block at most three ads. And the other um, factor we have to consider are site dynamics. So this means that every time a user visits the site, you know, different ads can be served, different content can be served to the user. So testing a particular filter rule once is not enough. You have to test it multiple times to make sure that they are effective across different, different visits. So next, I'm going to explain formulation using standard uh, terminology for reinforcement learning. So now the filter list author is replaced with what we call an agent who's a smart entity that is tasked with um, learning the best rules for the site. And the agent's goal is to actually um, maximize its cumulative reward uh, over time by just you know, testing rules out and getting reward back. And it has to maximize the reward over a particular time period. And so you know, the agent cannot just simply randomly select rules to uh, test. They have to be smart about it. So in order to do so, the agent's going to follow what we call a policy. And this policy will help at each time step uh, tell the agent, OK, uh, select this particular rule to test. And um, it's going to help basically balance the exploitation of certain good rules that we know will get high reward, and also exploring rules that we are uncertain about but may have high reward. And our filter rules here, we will now call them actions. Um, and our action space is basically the list of possible filter rules to consider. And in order to automatically derive these rules, we're just going to simply take our list of outgoing network requests and then you know, automatically generate uh, the rules based on granular levels. And our action space will have a um, hi hierarchy structure as well. Uh, so if we focus on a particular node here, we can see, for example, doubleclick.net is an ESLD form. And it has a edges to the right that for FQDNs. And this is, has a more finer grained relationship. And the intuition, intuition here is that uh, we want to try the coarser grain first, right? Uh, because it's more preferred. But if it causes too much breakage, then we can try more specific rules. Now, the vertical edges here denote a initiator relationship. So for example, doubleclick.net is going to initiate a, uh, other requests to uh, clmbtech.com. Uh, then we, the intuition is that we want to block the top of the chain, because maybe the whole chain is ad-related. Now, of course, if that's not effective or um, there is too much breakage, then we'll try its children. So this hierarchical structure basically reduces the number of actions that the agent needs to explore. And so the agent's going to apply a rule in what we call the environment. And this environment encompasses the browser and the inputs from the user, like uh, what site to test. And now the environment's going to give back basically um, a reward. Uh, this replaces the uh, visual inspection. And this reward is going to measure the effectiveness of uh, blocking ads of, of the filter rule. So how do we do this in an automated fashion? So what we do is we now represent the site as three basic visual counters. For example, the counters of ads, the counters of images, and the counters of text. And we can do this automatically by using components, existing components like, for example, Ad Highlighter that looks at, um, that annotates basic ads that has ad transparency logos. For images and text, we can write our custom JavaScript, for example, um, looking at the size of the image, width and height, and opacity to see whether it's visual um, shown to the user. And for text, we can look at you know, um, whether the text, it's a text node type. And uh, all right, so 
we're going to repeat what um, the Flexible has authored before. We're going to know the base representation of the site, right, without any action applied. What are the counters that we expect? And then we can com compare them when the action is applied. So when you, do you apply doubleclick.net, what happens to these three counters? Here we can see that the ads um, went down to zero, so that's good. And then we can also compare the numbers of images and text. And this can change because of maybe site dynamics or because of the rule. So I'll defer more details of how the actual reward is in the paper. But important to note here is that the reward considers how much ads were blocked and how much legitimate content is missing to measure breakage. And we also allow a user to turn to in a particular knob. And we call this threshold W. So it basically denotes how much the user cares about avoiding breakage. So it's from zero to one. So for example, if a filterless author can pass to auto FR uh, one for W, which denotes that, okay, we want to avoid breaking, uh, avo avoid breakage at all costs. Now, of course, a user, maybe a power user, um, it's okay to, you know, break the page a little bit in terms of, okay, I'd rather have, you know, ads blocked. So here we'll revisit these challenges and how this formulation has addressed them. For example, the threshold W allows us to control the amount of acceptable breakage. The hierarchical action space allows us uh, to learn the right granularity of rules um, with acceptable breakage as well. So, you know, if ESOD is good, then we should stick with it. If it's not, we'll go more uh, finer grain. Our formulation using reinforcement learning allows us to completely automate the human uh, process of filter rule generation. And our reward function ensures that the agent learns rules that are effective at blocking ads. So next, I'll explain how we go from this particular net, uh, framework to implementing it as a practical tool. And I'm going to focus only on one major bottleneck here, is that every time you test the rule, um, you have to go visit the site. And of course, this is depending on the site, but it can take up to like 45 seconds to a minute uh, to wait for it to load, to see if ads are gonna be served. And this is actually a big problem when uh, using reinforcement learning for real world applications. So basically, the agent has to test hundreds, even thousands of times. And we predicted this would take hours per site. So in order to uh, resolve this particular bottleneck, I'm going to um, present this concept of a site snapshot. It's basically a graph representation of how the site is loaded, and it connects you know, how uh, the structure of the DOM to network requests and JavaScript as well. And um, here, give an example one. It's a simple site with a div and two images, and each image is initiating its own request to grab that resource. But in its raw format, we kind of don't know which image we should care about. So what we can do is, like, like I said before, we can write custom uh, JavaScript to annotate this graph like this to show that uh, the one with the blue background is visible to the user. So we care about that image. The one that's grayed out is invisible to the user. So if we apply a particular rule here on the graph and it blocks this URL, then we know that, okay, it's bad because it's blocking legitimate content. Now, if we block the other URL, well, we're not gonna care about it. For example, number two here is the same. Uh, we first need to annotate this graph for example, with this iframe, we don't really know whether it's an ad or not. So we can use ad, ad highlighter, for example, to annotate it and say, okay, this iframe is an ad, and we can use our custom JavaScript to annotate the image. So the blue image is also visible to the user. So now when we apply the rule, uh, if a rule blocks JavaScript B here, we're gonna know that, okay, that's good. It blocks the ad. But if the rule blocks JavaScript A, we know that it's going to have mixed effects. It's going to block both legitimate content and ads. So here, what we've done is we're going to replace the browser now with a set of sites, of site snapshots. And what we're gonna do is collect 10 site snapshots so we visit the site for real to capture the site dynamics. And these are locally saved files in terms of graph ML files. And, um, so for each action where we apply the rule, 
we are going to randomly select from the set of 10 and then read into basic read in memory and select it and then apply the rule in a post-processing manner. And so what we've effectively done is reduced the uh, required number of visits to the site from hundreds to thousands down to a fixed number like 10. Oh, and I'll show it, uh, play the demo please. Oh, here, I'll show it in terms of a Python script. I'm gonna pass in crickbiz.com, and then the set of science snapshots that I already collected. And then we're going to uh, play it here. So what we see that it's going to go through the reinforcement learning um, portion of the algorithm to output rules. So we can see here that it outputted a filter list with uh, three rules, and this is only per site, so it's only for crickbuzz.com. We're now, okay, the uh, experiment took about four seconds, and the initialization time took three, three seconds, so about seven seconds overall. We're now gonna use this verbose uh, logging to show reinforcement learning iteration. So here we selected a particular action to test out. So we're gonna block this particular um, JavaScript. And we're going to randomly select a snap site snapshot. So here I print out the uh, name of the uh, site snapshot from the possible 10. And we see that we get uh, the three counters again. So images, ads, and text. And we can see the ads are zero. But the reward, oh sorry, and we have to make sure that the rule actually triggered, of course, because that um, matters. And then the reward here is zero. So basically for this particular example, um, the rule was able to block ads, but it caused breakage that we didn't want, so the reward was zero. And so next, I'll present our evaluation of auto FR. So in terms of efficiency, like I said, you, when we visit the site for real, we predict that it would take about 13 hours. Um, this is an estimated number. If we compare it to using site snapshots, this, there's a huge improvement, down to 1.6 minutes uh, per, per site to collect and use the site snapshots. And this is a real number of when applied the average number applied to the top 5K sites. In terms of performance, uh, we apply both AutoFR and EaseList on the top 5K sites. And we find that they have you know, a comparable uh, performance here. Next, we also repeat the same experiment six months later. And we find that about 6% of sites needed their rules to be updated. And we envision uh, filter list authors or ad blockers companies can just simply use AutoFR to update the rules for these particular sites. We also compare the rule granularity. So uh, with, in terms of uh, the rules that were created by AutoFR, and compare that to EaseList, the rules that were triggered uh, by EaseList on the top 5K. And we can see that this, the distribution of rule granularity is similar to EaseList. Uh, ESOD is the most common that triggered, and FQDNs and width paths uh, are less uh, common. So here, in summary, AutoFR can fully automate the uh, filter rule generation uh, as a framework. It focuses right now on URL-based rules uh, per site that can block ads. Right now, it only considers visual breakage. And we can implement the framework as a practical tool using site snapshots and the performance is comparable to EaseList uh, in the wild. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. So uh, we have a bit of time left for questions, if you want to. So let's see. Oh, there we go. Anton goes first. All right, can you say more about uh, how you evaluated the performance versus EasyList? Yeah, so there's actually lots of details. In, or in order to make EasyList more comparable with what AutoFAR is doing, because we're only focusing on those three rules, basically what I did was I stripped out all, um, all non-URL-based rules. So I just kept everything for uh, network blocking rules and then ap apply them on the top 5K. Um, that's about it. 
I, I evaluate it in terms of autofar can actually, uh, you know, we can use it to e evaluate the performance as well because it can get that reward back. In the paper, I also do a manual verification of the results, and it was similar as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, right next to you. I would also like to ask about the uh, performance, uh, uh, how you compared it. Uh, have you compared the actual number of uh, rules that were generated by out of fire and uh, how many rules EasyList had for the same website? So w were there any things that out of fire missed? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we will actually be updating the paper for version two very soon. So in, in that version, I do uh, compare the rules that were generated versus East list that was triggered. Um, we find that there are a lot of differences, um, but we don't see them as missed. This is because, uh, well, you know, East list is created through a human process, right? In terms of what AutoFAR is doing, um, the algorithm only will output rules that can actually block some ads on all the 10 uh, site snapshots. So it's a very conservative approach. For example, if a rule only blocked ads on one of them, we are we consider that not very good in terms of being robust against site dynamics. Um, that's that's one that's one of the reasons that's on top of my head right now. But yes, uh, there I can give you more examples later. But there are definitely differences. I think there was a question over there earlier. Uh, uh, so it looks like a critical part of this system is the ad annotator. And it seems like if it's working correctly and it's able to tag ads on our website, it's almost like doing half of the job. And it, it might just, why would the user not, not use the ad annotator to annotate the ads and hide them through element hiding? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, first, uh, AutoFAR can be a framework, so it's actually agnostic of any of the components. So you can kind of interchange them with any other component, right? Um, second, yes, ML-based rules or ML-based approaches or other, um, or using heuristics as well, they simply, um, they're not comparable to filter rules, right? Whereas we're, this particular, um, particular purpose of AutoFAR is to help generate filter rules. So what we found is that most of these approaches will, uh, when you just simply generate what they target as blocking, then it's going to be mostly rules with paths. And so what we've, of course, that has its cons as well, like what I've shown in the beginning of the presentation. I hope that answers your question. Looks like a follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, that does answer my question to a degree. So um, maybe a different question is that. So are you also considering cosmetic filters or element hiding filters? Yeah, that's definitely what's planned for future work. Uh, I think we can expand the action space to consider element hiding rules or even um, JavaScript-based rules, right? Uh, I think the initiator chain has what script, you know, uh, what script is executed, which method is executed, and that can be connected to perhaps the element on the page. Uh, oh, so, and also um, other cosmetic rules. Yeah, I, yeah, so I, I do think it's ex extendable. Bachi, you may want to do this. <laughs> Hi, um, have you considered uh, adapting AutoFR for uh, detecting trackers. So you could repeat the same kind of um, process, but um, reward it when there are no changes. To, so you can block the, the different requests, and if there's nothing changed on the, on the site, that would be a reward, uh, rewarded, rather. Yes, we definitely consider that. That's going to be follow-up work, so um, look out for that. Um, there's, I think, several approaches that we can do with this. We can just integrate existing um, ML models that are uh, that can target tracking requests, and then 
use the algorithm to create rules for them. Um, oh yeah, one other thing I forgot to mention is that a lot of the other works as well, they don't test the rule after they you know, target it, basically. R uh, RFR actually tests the rules multiple times to ensure that it's within acceptable breakage. So that's also very important. Thanks. Uh, did you look at all that breakage across domains? It seems to me that as a filterless developer, oftentimes something would work fine on the site that you're on, and then you don't realize that it broke Google Docs, for instance. So. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. So what we did in the paper, well, in the beginning, what I presented is that I think this is a very core problem to filter, to filter rule generation in terms of creating rules from scratch. Uh, in the paper at the end, we also try to figure out a approach to go from per site rules to global, what we call global rules. And yes, of course, global rules have the potential to break, or what we call collateral damage, right? It can break sites or unseen sites even. So what we did was we used a simple heuristics, such as the popularity of rules. So for example, if Autofar created the same rule for three or more sites, then we convert that into a global rule. Uh, in the paper, we create 10 filter lists based on different popularities, uh, like one, two, three, four, five, and then we, we test two of them. We test the base one where we're like, okay, let's just take all the per site rules and put them in a, a filter list, act as global rules, apply it on the top 5K to 10K sites, so those are unknown to AutoFR. We do the same for the popularity that is uh, of three. So, the rule becomes a global rule if three sites created that particular rule as well. Um, and we found that it, it, I think we achieved 80% uh, compared to easily stayed at 87% actually, right? Um, so it's still not bad, but what we found, I think it's a much more uh, challenging problem and we're we're actually also trying to do this in future work, so there's lots of different pathways for future work for AutoFR.